I'm Becky Gerritsen. I am the Executive Director for Eagle Forum of Alabama. And Eagle Forum of Alabama is also a member of the Compassion Coalition, who is trying to protect vulnerable children in Alabama. During this episode, we're going to have an important discussion on the bodily harm being done to gender-confused children in Alabama and why we must pass the Alabama Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act. I want to tell you a little bit about our guest tonight. Patrick uh, Lappert is a doctor from North Alabama. He is an MD and he's been in practice for over 38 years. He is trained in aerospace medicine. He's board certified in general surgery as well as plastic and reconstructive surgery. He has extensive experience in pediatric congenital deformities. He's the author of the single most cited article on the subject of breast reconstruction. He's been in the Navy for 24 years and served as a department chairman at the largest military hospital in the world. He was also a specialty advisor to the Surgeon General in the U.S. Navy on matters pertaining to reconstructive surgery. He has written book chapters on the subject of morality and ethics in transgender medicine and surgery. And we are so happy to have him here tonight. Good afternoon, Becky. Thanks for inviting me along. This is a very important conversation we're gonna have here. Yes, and you have been just a superstar in this area, not only in Alabama, but across the nation. You are seen as an expert in this field. And I wanna thank you for testifying for this bill that we tried to pass last year and this year in Alabama to protect these children. You did a great job, both the House and Senate testimonies. And uh, we do have those on our website at alabamaeagle.org if people want to go there later. Before we get really started in the discussion, I wanted to talk a little bit. I just let people know because I think some people don't realize what's happening in America. But in the U.S., girls as young as 13 are having double mastectomies. Um, boys as young as 17 are getting full genital sex reassignment surgeries. Um, in the U.S., we have kids that are 11 years and older that are taking cross-sex hormones, which can render them sterile um, and give them lifelong health problems. And in Alabama, we have children as young as eight. Those are third graders that are taking puberty blockers for the reason to change their sex. I mean, it's very, very sad what is happening. So, Dr. Lapper, will you just explain to us what is gender dysphoria? Is it a medical condition or what? Well, the term gender dysphoria is something that's been recently introduced into the language of uh, this issue. Historically, uh, this condition was referred to as a, a form of body dysmorphic disorder or gender identity disorder. Uh, but because some people objected to that language of disorder, disease, or pathology, they uh, sought to change the language to sort of depathologize the problem. So the, the term gender dysphoria just speaks about the unhappiness. That's what dysphoria means. It means unhappiness about one's gender. And gender is a very imprecise term. Even that word was, was hijacked uh, recently. Mm -hmm. Historically, we referred to this as uh, sex, but the term gender has been introduced and it kind of muddies the water. But in any case, we'll allow the use of the word but what it really means is unhappiness about their sex appearance. So appearing male, uh, if you're, if you're a, a boy, or appearing female, if you're a girl, in, in some way provokes unhappiness in the child or the young adult. And, uh, and so that's what, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about an, an emotional state, an interior wound, where the person who suffers with it seeks a physical explanation for their anxiety or their unhappiness. And they think the reason they're unhappy or sad is because of the appearance of their body. So this isn't something new in the world of plastic surgery. People come to plastic surgeons all the time thinking that their unhappiness has something to do with the way they look. But in this particular case, we're talking about a persistent idea that this person has that they're somehow in the wrong body or their sex presentation is incorrect. They feel themselves to be the other sex. And so that's what this is about. And it's a, it's a real condition, and, and the children and young adults who suffer with it are very likely to uh, abuse substances, alcohol, drugs, uh, harm themselves in a variety of ways. Um, and uh, so this is, this is a reality that we have to deal with. It's a real psychological condition. But is it a medical condition? That's something yes. that really deserves conversation. Yes, yeah. yes. please. So uh, if, if, if you is want- Is there a can... test? Can you, yeah. can you do That's a medical right. test? 
That's a that's an excellent question because uh, we're always looking for the causes of things, and if we can find a material explanation, then we then we address that as the medical condition that we're now going to treat. In the case of gender dysphoria, this this diagnosis is a is a subjective diagnosis that the child makes. The child says they feel that they are in the wrong body or they feel that they are the wrong quote gender. Uh, but there is no medical test that I can do. There's no, I can't look at their chromosomes. I can't look at, at, at their uh, genetic studies. I can't look at their hor the hormonal environment of their body. I can't do brain scans. I can't do any dynamic studies of any kind that can prove or disprove the diagnosis. So at, at the end of the day, what you have is a very serious diagnosis that's being made by a prepubertal child. And there's nothing the doctor can do to prove or disprove it. So let me just reiterate this then. I heard someone during a debate during the sports bill this last week on the Alabama in the Alabama legislature. Um, one of the people got up and said that these children can be tested as little kids. And if they have more testosterone, that's a girl, and they, if they have more testosterone in their body, then it means they should be a boy and they should be treated. We, They were saying this at the microphone that there is a test that can be done to show these kids are born in the wrong body. That is incorrect. That is, I won't call it a lie because I, I always assume that people are working out of goodwill. But the fact is that between boys and girls, as with all biological traits, there is some measure of overlap. So every, every male body that produces testosterone also produces estrogens. And every female body that produces predominantly estrogens also has uh, testosterone or other androgens as well. There is some overlap, uh, but there is no specific quantitative study of male or female hormones that makes any diagnosis about transgender. Okay, so it is the child's diagnosis that is moving them towards these medical interventions. That so let's correct. talk about some of those. Um, there. The, our bill, the uh, Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act, bans three types of procedures. It, and this is for healthy children. So it's puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and um, cro re sex reassignment surgeries until the children are 19 years old, which in Alabama, that is of legal age. So that's what this bill does. If the child has a true medical condition like precocious puberty, or a chromosomal disorder, this bill does not impact them in any way. This bill is written specifically for healthy children for the reason of them wanting to change their sex, and that's it. So what do puberty blockers, we're told that kids can go on puberty blockers, it's no big deal, it's just a pause button. What's tell? When do kids take puberty blockers and what do they okay. do? Okay, so the justification for giving puberty blockers to self-diagnosed, self-identified transgender children. The justification for that is that by pausing normal adolescent development, pubertal development, that it quote unquote buys the child time to make a decision, do they really wanna continue on and transition to the other sex? And the claim will be made that we have lots of experience with puberty blocking drugs in children and that it's completely reversible. We've used them for decades. Right. And say, both, we've used them for decades. Both of those statements are misrepresentations. They are not true. We have a tremendous amount of experience in the use of puberty blocking drugs in the care of children with actual medical diagnoses. So you mentioned precocious puberty. This is a medical condition that is a, is a major risk to the child. You might have like a, a seven-year-old child who is having uh, sex development that that's basically adult level sex development, maturation of the breasts, the growth of axillary and pubic hair, and, way and, and things early. like that, way too early, yeah. And so what puberty blocking drugs are used for is to normalize their sex hormone levels so that they go through normal sexual maturation at the right stages in their life, and you don't have this massive interference in their skeletal growth and, and secondary sexual characteristics. So, so yes, we have experience with the use of puberty blockers, but the experience we have is applying them to children with medical conditions. There Disease. is no, there is no or, track, exactly. There's no track record for the use of puberty blocking drugs in otherwise healthy children with normal levels of sex hormones at, at the normal stages of life. Now, we don't even have safety data for the youth. This is an off-label use. To use okay. puberty blocking drugs in self-identified transgender children is off-label. 
it's the FDA hasn't even allowed it as an application. If you look at the product insert, it says nothing about its use in transgender children. So there's no safety record for it. There's no track record of long-term effects. But here's what we know. Sex hormone levels rising in the course of puberty is a, is, is a critical part in the maturation of the child. It has, it has tremendous and far-reaching effects on the child's psychosexual development, uh, the, the development of their character, their skeletal growth. The so it's not of, just sex hormones. No. It's, it, okay, it, brain development. Everything, yeah. Brain development, uh, uh, emotional maturation, skeletal growth, muscle growth, uh, coordination, wow. higher executive functions of the brain, the ability to make rational and good decisions is that maturation of the brain is largely driven by the sex hormones that bring you through adolescence. And as you know, it isn't until late adolescence and into young adulthood that the real executive function of the brain finally reaches maturity. This yes. is the reason why we have laws on the books that prevent children from making adult decisions like, oh, is it a good time to drink and jump in the car? You know, right. or should, yeah, all so the things if, that we... If a child, uh, say young child goes on puberty blockers, and they're you're, they're pausing or stopping their natural development, so they're possibly hurting their brain development, their skeletal development. But their peers are going on normally, like they should, and they're going to be stunted. That's correct. So, so you they, have a you have a child who already feels alienated, feels different from the other children. Now you're giving them a very powerful drug that's going to essentially arrest their growth and development. So now their peers are growing and now they look decidedly different from their peers. And so it affirms in their minds that there's something different about them. Okay. And so the pause button really turns into a go button because now they're at a stage, well, I have to do something about my condition. I'm smaller, I'm, I'm weaker. Everybody else is you know, developing in these very important ways and I'm not. So the next step is almost Guarantee, well, it is guaranteed. You put a child on puberty blockers and there's nearly a 100% likelihood that they will be at the next level of transgender care, which is the use of cross-sex hormones. Okay, so I always wondered about that when I had heard that statistic, why, if we know these are bad and harmful, why would they go on to the next? But it's because they, they want to make up for lost time right. from the puberty blockers. That's okay. right. Uh, that yeah, and, and so they want to they want to take the next step. So you know, here you are, uh, children who are have gone through the prepubertal uh, growth that's that's typical, and now the peers are entering puberty, and there, there's massive skeletal growth and 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 all the social changes that go along with puberty, and this child is left behind, and so they want to they want to move along to the next step, and so if so they're being what, hmm? what ages would a child go on the cross sex hormones typically? Typically, uh, it, it's it's a little bit different between boys and girls, but but girls would would usually somewhere around twelve to thirteen years of age, and boys maybe thirteen, fourteen years of age, somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know some even at seventeen or eighteen are still taking cross sex hormones. Well, essentially, you are a lifetime forever. of cross forever. You, it becomes a lifetime okay. commitment. Uh, essentially, you're signing yourself over to being a a. Uh, a patient in a medical clinic for the rest of your life. Because, because you don't have, you don't automatically, even though you do the surgery, your DNA is not going to naturally make that extra sex hormone. You, so you're not going to make any. Keep taking it. You're not going to, yeah, you have to keep taking it for the rest of your life because the, first of all, the, the puberty blockers uh, uh, are not reversible. We don't, there's no evidence that they're reversible. And secondly, by the time you started using cross-sex hormones, you're essentially guaranteeing that the person's been sterilized. Okay. So they didn't have the normal prepubertal developmental processes, and now they don't have the normal pubertal developmental processes. So essentially, you're, you're, it's like a, a, a chemical castration. Okay, so the, yeah. the, that, that person will never produce their own sex hormones. Uh, they'll be dependent on them. And if they decide, well, I've, I've changed my mind, I want to go back to being a girl, they're going to be on estrogens. And if they change their mind and want to go back to be a boy, they're going to be on testosterone. Uh, mm. so, so that's not and reversible. They will it's not like, have to be able to have children. And they're never, making never. this decision at a very young age. That's okay, correct. let's talk about surgeries. For a, a male to have surgery, they cut off his private parts and try to build him. Because I don't want to say all these words just because we're on Facebook yeah, right now. Sure. Right. Um, yeah, but that man is going to have to have a mechanism that will keep that pouch open. 
That's right. So the, the, the because most your body wants to heal. That's right. So essentially, what the surgery is doing is it's is removing, destroying, mutilating their 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 native sex organs. Their uh, sex organs are, are are used to create a counterfeit female sex organ, and and that doesn't want to stay intact or in place. Right, you're creating a sleeve, if you will, out of the skin of the native parts and uh, modifying the other parts and trying to keep the nerve supply to that intact all the while but it doesn't want to remain that way it wants to collapse and and uh and shrink up and so it's a lifetime uh, commitment to trying to keep mm -hmm. the structure working uh as a receptive structure yes. uh it doesn't want to remain that way so so yes and 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 there's also a, a very high likelihood of complications from the surgery that can lead uh, very often leads to the need for repeated surgery to correct everything from urinary leakages to uh, 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 wound breakdown. It's mm -hmm. very susceptible to mechanical trauma, uh, particularly in the sex act. Uh, it does, it's not built to do what it's yes. being asked to do. And so the, the risk of injury, urinary leaks, uh, even malignant transformation, because that's one of the other things we didn't mention. The cross-sex hormones that are given to these patients are given at such high levels mm. that that there's a very high risk of all kinds of medical problems from blood clots uh, in the legs, those clots migrating into the lungs, causing pulmonary emboli, stroke, heart attack, and you have a very high increase in malignant transformation or malignancy uh, in in any area of the body, really, but particularly where you have areas of repeated trauma or wound healing issues. So. Uh, that's something that always needs to be uh, remembered is that not only are you giving cross-sex hormones to try to change their body, but those high levels that are required to make a female body look like a male body or a male body look like a female body yeah. have very high risk associated with them. Yes. And those new parts that they make for both men and women, they're, they're non-functioning. They do that's not. That's correct. Yeah. They, they're they they're are, just they, a costume piece, basically. Counterfeits. Count, yeah. They're counterfeit structures. You cannot surgically or medically turn a man into a woman, a boy into a girl, or or vice versa. What you're doing is you're creating a counterfeit. Uh, they're incapable of reproduction, and and in and in in virtually every case, the their function in terms of the erotic effects on the on the person are vastly degraded. So any sense of this as being uh, a, a benefit either in terms of the sex life of the person or their reproductive life is a complete lie. It's not mm -hmm. true at all. You sterilize them through a process of mutilation to produce a counterfeit structure, which goes against the most foundational moral principles of plastic and reconstructive surgery. We always have to honor form and function, and mm -hmm. you never destroy function to try to produce a form least of all to produce a counterfeit form and, and a what healthy function start it started off as a healthy body part exactly right so if i did that kind of surgery on any other part say for example if i if i uh destroyed a, a person's nose it, it robbed them of their ability to breathe through their nose with an operation to make the perfect appearing nose that would be considered malpractice wow. but here we are we're destroying sexual functioning for the sake of producing a counterfeit it's the most immoral thing imaginable in the world of plastic surgery, and yet it's now accepted as plastic surgery. Well, let's move away from the medical a little bit and talk about the characteristics of children with gender confusion. I understand that these children really do have issues, and but it's right. usually not just gender dysphoria. There's usually other things that go along with it, and one that I just am blown away by is that children with autism, they're seven times more likely to be gender confused. Right. And I think that's so important for parents to understand. We have a lot of autism in our world today. And I think that parents need to really be aware that that is something they need to watch out for. And, and some of these other, what are some of the other issues that are very normal uh, characteristics of these children? Well, th so we need to make the distinction between uh, children who are prepubertal uh, who have gender confusion, and then uh, and then children and young adults who have the persistence of it. You see, if you okay. leave these if you leave these children alone, most of the confusion goes away on its own. But if you if you encourage them to think this way about themselves, it tends to persist. So children who have gender confusion well into the years of puberty 
are at a very high likelihood that if you if you uh, e evaluate them and examine them, you're going to find that they have, uh, first of all, obsessive compulsive disorder is what you would expect because gender identity disorder is a form of obsessive compulsive disorder, just like all of the other body dysmorphic disorders, mm -hmm. like anorexia, for example, is a body dysmor a form of body dysmorphic disorder uh, that is a, a, a one of the subcategories of obsessive compulsive disorder. In the case of the anorexic, their obsessive thought is that they're fat. In the case of the gender confused child, their obsessive thought is that they're in the wrong body or that they're the wrong sex. That's the obsessive thought that leads to the compulsive behavior that may begin with cross-dressing and, and moves along. Uh, so, so with that in mind, what you, what you find is not only a, a high likelihood of, of that they're on the autism spectrum, but that they have a very high likelihood of significant depression mm. because of what this obsessive thought is doing in their life. It's radically affecting the way they interact with other children or other young adults. And, uh, and, and certainly cognitive deficits uh, are, in, are, are among the characteristics of, of all of these disorders that they, they have a misunderstanding or a misapprehension of the reality around them. They misapprehend themselves, yeah. just as the anorexic woman, female, Yes. Sees a slender body in the mirror, but in her mind she sees obesity. That is a cognitive problem that needs to be addressed with cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and Just so, like how you wouldn't give an anorexic liposuction. You wouldn't give them liposuction no. or gastric bypass. Yeah, they you wouldn't. You wouldn't give them diet pills. You wouldn't do any of those things because you don't feed a delusion. It's right. a delusion thought that the, that, the, that the young person's having. So what you, you, you need to encourage them always with reality, with the truth, uh, because you're not serving anybody. It's not charitable. It's not, it's not in, in the interest of the person to encourage them to believe something that isn't true. How could that yes. possibly lead to a happy life? And so, yes, the comorbidities as we call them, and obsessive compulsive disorder, major anxiety disorders, major depressive disorders, autism spectrum, and a very high likelihood of self-medication with everything mm -hmm. from alcohol to drugs of various kinds mm -hmm. to uh, dangerous behaviors, cutting, all those sorts of things are very common. I, I just wanted to say one of the things, we're going to go to this in just a second, is I think that kids see this mainstream porn at a very early age. They're watching it on the school bus in second grade on their phones. Uh, literally, that's happening here in Wetumpka. And um, I believe that when they see what is happening to girls, they don't want to be a girl. Um, right. And I had a mother come up to me and said that her her daughter was developing and the guys were sexting her. And, and now all of a sudden she wants a binder. She wants to be a boy. Right. This just makes sense. There, there are other things going on. But Dr. Uh, Lapper, why is transgenderism so mainstream now? What is going on? Well, it's it's the full fruit of the the whole gender ideology that w that's been gradually growing in its dimensions since the 1960s. What started out as first wave feminism has now developed into this this horrifying confusion of uh, of gender issues, and so and children are being presented with this confusion uh, at very early ages, and uh, they're being asked questions about their sexuality at second grade level. You know, if you ask a, a second grade child, a seven, eight year old child, what their sexual preferences are, they're not even going to know what you're talking about. And how do children find out what you're talking about? They go on the internet. So children are trying to understand their sexuality by surfing porn, you yes. know, and, and this is how can you possibly expect that that's going to come to a good conclusion. Your point about uh, feelings of safety, that's one of the key elements in, in transgenderism uh, that, that oftentimes not only is there a family dynamic problem, but there's a, a real sense of danger about, about adult sexuality. And so they, in seeking to avoid that, th this issue becomes uh, perhaps a, a, a way of interpreting the world that sounds safer to them. Yes. Especially when you see how tr self-declared transgender children are celebrated now. And so yes. they get tremendous affirmation. They get tremendous safe space protection yes. wherever they go. And so children will turn to that as a, as a way of feeling safe in the world while they're being asked questions they don't know the answer to and while they're seeing images that look horrifying and frightening that they don't yes. want any part of. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I This is a, an interesting slide here. When a teen announces his or her transgender identity in his peer group, 3.5 of his friends will also 
say the same right. thing. And this was a, from a 2019 study that in just seven years, 2000% increase in children seeking treatment for gender confusion. That was in the UK. Right. But what are the stats in America for that? Right. So the, the, the statistics vary from one country to the next and what, from one moment to the next, one study to the next. So there was a study in Sweden that was published about, uh, well, within the, within the last year that demonstrated a 1500% increase in, in self-identified transgenderism. Recent studies in the United States show that number to be closer to 4,000% wow. over the last five years. Now, just ask yourself this question. If this was truly a biological process, how could you possibly have a 4,000% increase in the diagnosis? And you can't tell me that it's because children feel safer now in coming out as transgender mm -hmm. because uh, you know American society is so anti-trans or transphobic or whatever. These are numbers coming from Sweden, which mm -hmm. has been on board with gender ideology now for longer than any other European country and certainly longer than the United States. It's almost the ideal society for the LGBT uh, way of looking at things, right. and yet they're seeing a 1,500% increase in Sweden alone. How could you possibly expect that mm -hmm. that's a biological process? Did we have some massive mutation event? Impossible. It's a social contagion. And that, that point that you had in the slide of three and a half, 3.5 peers yes. will also self-declare at the same time, it just points right to the social contagion that it is. And there was a very important paper that came out of Brown University about two years ago by uh, an author named Lisa Littman that identified this condition that she called rapid onset gender dysphoria. And what she found was that it occurred in clusters of almost always young females who are late adolescent, young adult, who will self-identify and then, and then it sort of gets passed around through online communication yes. and they coach each other about what to say to the doctor, what to say to the parents, what to say to the psychologist to move this process of transitioning along. And this is where you see these massive outbreaks in middle schools and high yes. schools. I'm dealing with an outbreak in my local grade school of sixth, seventh grader girls who so all of a sudden there's two or three of them in the seventh grade who are all self-identifying as transgender. Yes. It's a social contagion. Yes. And well, it's, being, it's being fomented by what they're hearing in school and what they're seeing online. I see when you were talking about um, they're grooming each other. One of the things that they do is they are they learn and they groom uh, these kids about what to say about suicide to their counselors and to their parents so that they will get the drugs. And That's right. you've, you, I want to talk about suicide because this is the main argument that we get that if we do, if we ban these procedures, then these kids are going to commit suicide. Right. And they will cite some studies that say that suicide rates are better if they're on these drugs. So tell us okay. about these studies. Very important to understand. First of all, it, it has to be accepted that that, that self-identified gender dysphoric children and young adults do have a higher suicide rate. That is a fact. Whether it's 20 times more or 15 times more or five times more, it makes no difference. They have a very high suicide rate. Now, the question is, does transgender medicine and surgery lower the suicide rate? The problem is when you look at the medical literature on the subject, virtually all of the studies that you find are studies that are small in numbers of patients and have a very short follow-up time. So if you ever are presented with a, a medical journal that says, ah, transgender medicine and surgery lowers suicide rate, the first thing to look at is how many patients were enrolled and how long did they follow them? And if were they only... voluntary? Vo exactly. Um, some of these... So voluntary. So if, exactly. if they jumped out, if they jumped out of the study or decided they wanted to detransition, they reported. They wouldn't they, report. They that. don't it's, it's called a self-selection bias. And that's one of the problems with it, among uh, many other bias problems in these studies. Well, it is the case that if you have an anxious person and you're constantly encouraging them with the idea that their life is going to get better if they take mm -hmm. the next step, well, they're going to be excited about that. But what the long-term studies show us is that People who have gone through the whole transition process from, you know, puberty blockade to cross-sex hormones to surgical transitioning, if you follow them out beyond about eight years following the completion of all of these interventions, the suicide rate will f f go right back to what it was before you did anything for them. So the, the temporary lowering of the suicide rate is true. But it's because only they're because looking, they're happy. They're in the middle of this new treatment and they're they're hopeful. The, they're surrounded by people who are calling them heroic and encouraging them and yeah. telling them how brave they are and how great life is going to be, but it never gets there. 
you have a child who has an interior wound, an interior anxiety, who's grown up to be an adult who has the same wound in their, in their, in their psyche. And all you've done is you've medically modified and surgically modified their body and in fact mutilated them, but they still have the same wound inside. So the suicide rate, and this is from long-term studies out of Sweden, the suicide rate for people who have completed transition is 19 times higher in transgender persons than in comparable members of the, of the population. If you match them for age, for sex, other demographic data, You're just comparing transgender fully transitioned to the rest of the population, 19 times higher. And if you just look at females who have transitioned to quote unquote male, it's 40 times higher. Wow. 40 I times higher, exactly. And so you haven't cured anybody, you haven't helped anybody. You've spent a lot of money and subjected them to incredible disfigurement uh, that's permanent and sterilize them and everything else, but they, they still have the same psychological wound that you refuse to address. You refuse to address it because all they got was affirmation yes. in what amounts to an obsessive compulsive problem, fear, anxiety, depression, perhaps even autism that you have labeled as transgender and you've called it a, a, a medical condition and you've subjected them to this, all these medical processes and you never addressed what was really wrong. So maybe this is something we should be focusing on more than just giving drugs and doing surgery. What is watchful waiting? Watchful waiting is what we've always done. Watchful waiting isn't just sitting around on your hands. Watchful waiting is a recognition of the fact that the vast majority of children who receive normal nurturance, raise, raise them as, as children have always been raised, educate them, encourage them, encourage them with the truth that over 80% of children, by the time they're in middle adolescence and they see the changes that are happening in their body, they abandon this idea of themselves as the wrong sex. And if you follow those same people up into young adulthood, the number goes way over 90% of them get over it. So essentially what, what, what you're looking at is that if you took those same children and just did watchful waiting, that may include family therapy, that probably includes some form of, of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, that the vast majority, over 90% of them will be cured of the problem. But if you enroll those same children in a gender clinic, virtually 100% of them will continue on to transition and transition and transition, which mm -hmm. means that 90% of the people that are being treated in a gender clinic have been misdiagnosed. And remember, that diagnosis was made by a pre-adolescent child. Is this the practice of medicine that's moral? No, it's malpractice. There's no other word for it. Yeah, we have a question from one of our viewers on Facebook, Margaret. She says, can you speak to the standard of care in Alabama for gender confused children and how they relate to guidelines established by the professional medical organizations? So. I know at the state house, um, the the opponents of this bill will say we're messing with the standard of care in Alabama. So can you address that? Yeah. First of all, there's no such thing as the standard of care in Alabama. There's no there's no uh, consensus statement by the uh, Alabama Medical Association or or any other such body that says this is how you are to treat transgender children. So so there is no uh, there's no such standard. Are there guidelines? Well, the gender clinics use guidelines that were that have been promulgated by an organization called the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. This is not a consensus of professionals from the endocrine society or the pediatric associations or anybody else. This is a this is a political document that was that, that that's been put out there that in order to qualify as a quote unquote professional in the in the world of transgender health, you have to agree with everything that the WPATH guidelines says. So, and what they'll say is that if you don't agree with the WPATH guidelines, you're not a professional and you can be ignored. So first of all, there is no standard of care that Alabama has. And okay. secondly, the guidelines are not a consensus statement by anybody, even, the, even what is called the the, the guidelines from the uh, endocrine society or the guidelines for the American Pediatric Association, these are guidelines that were promulgated by a very small group of people, nine in the case of the uh, Pediatric Association, nine people got together, seven of whom were gender advocates, and they came up with these statements that you have to affirm. There was no polling of the pediatricians in America. There was no poll given to the endocrinologists in America saying, how would you treat a transgender child? No, these guidelines are being published 
And it's and it's what what amounts to essentially is the political document. So. Yes, I want to address what's happening and how parents are being left in the dark. A lot of times, children will transition at school. They will get to school and they'll change their clothes. They'll be called a different name, different pronoun. Everyone knows this at school, but the parents have no idea. We had a parent that called our organization with this exact problem, and how he found out is the teacher wrote a letter home with using the wrong pronoun. And that's how all of this came about. So one of, not only does our bill prohibit the three things, the puberty blockers, cross sex hormones, and the sex reassignment surgeries, it also encourages the school personnel to not hide it from the parents and to help the child not withhold that information from the parents. The parents love their children and they want to help them. And as we saw in an earlier slide, these children have a lot of issues going on. They need the love of their parents and they need to, this should not be hidden from them. And so we just wanted to put that in there that it would be encouraged that um, they do not withhold this information. That's very important to understand because as we talked about earlier, the care of a, a, a gender dysphoric child, it, 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 one of the central elements of their care in order to get them over this problem is, is family dynamics. You have to look at the family dynamics. And if you're separating the family from what's going on in the life of the child, you've done them a tremendous disservice. And what it presumes is that, that the parents are pathological. The whole idea that you're going to withhold information from the parents assumes that, child, that, that, that the parents are pathological. The second thing is, is the, is the claim is made that the child has a right to privacy or something like that. Well, first of all, yes. a child coming out as transgender in school has made the issue public. So all that the school is required is being required to do is let the parents know what's going on with the child. Because if the parents are trying to encourage the child to understand reality, and every time they get off the, the bus at school, mm -hmm. they're being encouraged to not accept that reality of what their sex self is, then you're working across purposes. You're working at, uh, against the greatest resource that the child has, which is hopefully an intact yes. family. Right, right. So as we kind of wrap things up, um, I just want people to know what they can do to help uh, help these vulnerable children in Alabama. So I would encourage everyone to support SB10 and people can go to our website, alabamaeagle.org, and you will see an issues tab where you can find out a lot more about uh, VCAP and the transgender issue. We have resources for parents that are going through this. We have great videos. You can see um, Dr. Lappert's testimonies in there. You can also contact your elected officials. You can get our alerts. We give weekly legislative update alerts. This is becoming such a trend and it's being pushed from this administration. This is not going away. And I just want to encourage everyone watching this to speak the truth. You cannot change a person's sex. And these children and adults need love. They need compassion. Uh, we need to help them accept reality and, and get the help that they need. Do you have any closing remarks? No, you've, you've hit it out of the park. Well, I wanna thank you so much for being with us tonight. And we look forward to having more discussions like this in the future. Have a great night.